All right, there we go. Uh, so tonight, as the title would suggest, we are focusing on uh, research that is happening that's focused on the American woodcock that has a number of very creative common names. I'm not sure if Debbie will touch on those this evening, but they are a lot of fun. So you may not have heard all of them, uh, but they do have some pretty fun names um, for this particular bird species. And Debbie, we were so excited that you were interested in sharing your love of this bird and the work that you are doing to support them uh, through this project. So for those of you who are not familiar with Debbie Peterson, uh, she is a teacher, a biologist, a bird bander, and a hunter, and really loves sharing her passions with others. And I've been very lucky to uh, be a guest and to be able to experience that. Debbie was formerly the education director for Hawk Ridge here in Minnesota. If you have not been, I highly encourage you to check it out. It is a gem of a location, a wonderful spot for learning about and observing migrating raptors, especially during that fall migration season. She now works to inspire high school students to learn about and explore the outdoors. Debbie's been hunting with pointing dogs for over 20 years and banding birds for 26 years. Four years ago, she was able to combine her love of pointing dogs and birds by becoming a certified woodcock bander. And that is how we came to this program tonight. So Debbie, I'm going to let you take it away and thank you so much for, for being here with us tonight. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm always excited to talk about birds. That's usually what I talk about. Um, now I get to talk about my dogs as well. And I'm gonna shut my video off in the interest of um, trying to save some bandwidth because I do have some videos um, in my presentation and I'm, I'm hoping that they're gonna work. So a little bit about me, I do, I wear a lot of hats. Um, I graduated way back in 1996 from Northern Michigan University. I have a Bachelor of Science in Ecology um, then I moved to Minnesota. I got my master's degree in environmental education at UMD. And then um, I spent 11 years as the education director for Hawk Ridge. So if any of you have been there um, between 2001 and 2011, you probably saw me up there. After that, um, I did a lot of soul searching. What did I want to do? And I decided I would like to teach. I love sharing all of my interests and my passions and science with others. Um, so I went back and I went to the College of St. Scholastica and I got my licensure for teaching high school science. Now, I love this because not only do I get to share my passion with others, but it also gives me time so that I can do research in my spare time. And I also involve my students a lot because not only do I teach biology and anatomy and physiology, but I teach um, wildlife management and I teach ornithology. Uh, I bring my students on a ton of different field trips, including running my dogs and banding woodcock chicks. Most of you I'm sure already know what a woodcock looks like. They are a forest shorebird and they're migratory so they're kind of under they're not a state game bird they are a federal they're under the feds and a few really cool things about American woodcock I think one of the coolest things to me is you know they probe in the soil with this beak and the tip of it right here will open without opening this part of the beak so it's what we call a prehensile bill they can just open the tip of it which is very handy for sticking it in the soil and then just being able to open the tip and grab onto a worm they live in the eastern united states i have this cool little video that i got from ebird and like i said before please forgive me if the videos are choppy that's a zoom thing not a debbie peterson thing january this is where they are right now I have transmitted birds down in this area. And then I have one that's over here in this area. And then this video is gonna show 
how they begin and end their northward migration, and then where do they spend the summer, and then their video, the video shows them on their southward migration as well. I think one of the coolest things, and I, I'm going to press play again, is it shows, and you probably, you didn't see this on the southward journey, but it shows them stacked up in a lot of these places because the color over here shows relative abundance. So normally it's, it's you know, low abundance, but I think what this is showing is that they're getting stacked up. Um, they need to, they need to have warm soil or thawed soil to be able to stick their beaks in and find food. So I'm assuming that this is them stacking up on their northward migration. Let's see if I can get this to go to the next slide. Oop, there we go. Here is their range. Of course, they're in the eastern United States. This is their breeding range. This is migratory. This is where they spend the winter. And then this is where, for those lucky people, they spend all year. That's the purple, year round. Uh, my friend Mike put this video together for me. It's really great. It shows how they feed. And I think one of the coolest things in this video is that it shows their little dance. Research researchers aren't totally sure why they do this, but the thought is, is that it sends vibrations into the soil, which starts earthworms moving, and then it makes them easier to detect you can see that they grab with that tip of the bill and then they move it to the back, the base of the bill. I got to show it again. It's just so cute. They move the worm to the base of their bill and then swallow it down from there. If you've ever been out on a spring evening, and I can't even tell you how much I'm waiting for this to happen, you have probably heard this. This is a, a male woodcock, and he's doing part of his courtship ritual here. And I'm gonna skip ahead. He, he will do this for minutes until he finally takes off. And he does a really cool sky dance. Now, it's really hard to see a sky dance, and it's even more difficult to video a sky dance. So I have this. Um, I stole this from the Wisconsin-Madison Field Station. I am going to play what it sounds like when they are going up into the sky and flying around. And then I'll just kind of trace what they're. American woodcock. So they'll start off painting in a field. And then they take off and they fly up and they'll do circles around. And if you're ever going to, move this is the time to move because they're not seeing once you start to hear them start chirping like that they are on their way down and you need to be still and then when they are coming in for a landing they're silent and hopefully they land near you and they start painting all over again My love affair with Woodcock started back in 1996. Um, I worked for my professor who was, he's a, he was a Woodcock guy. Um, and I was looking for a picture online and I found this from 1984 in the New York Times. This is Bill Robinson. And even back then, you can't really see it very well, but he's holding a radio receiver he was putting radio transmitter backpacks on Woodcock back then. 
and then going out into the same areas in the spring and, and hoping that he would relocate them in the spring. He hired my friend Karen and I. Um, I was behind the camera, so I'm not in this photo, but this is my friend Karen. He hired Karen and I to go and set up nets. These are mist nets right here. And he hired us to capture woodcock. And this was during the summer and during the fall. Um, we put over 300 bands on woodcock during that time. Here's another picture. You can see, you know, Karen's got her hip boots on. It was, we were in some really nasty places. So I fell in love with Woodcock that fall. And I also met a guy, not this guy, but I met a guy from Pennsylvania. And he was, we were doing hunter surveys. He said, hey, why don't you come out with me? And he had a brace of English setters. He had two English setters and he ran them together. And this was my very first exposure to a pointing dog. He ran those dogs. They worked incredibly well together. They pointed woodcock. They were steady to wing, which means that they stayed pointing even when the bird flushed. They were steady to shot. They stayed pointing even when the hunter shot. And then he could release them. And yeah, it was one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen. And I wish I knew who that guy was because less than three years later, I had my own bird dog. So come full circle. I started with bird dogs a long time ago. I started with Woodcock an even longer time ago. Four years ago, five years ago, four, five years ago, I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw something about Woodcock banding. And I knew that people did Woodcock banding with dogs. And I thought, hmm, so I got on the phone and I called Jerry Havel, who is the owner operator of Pine Ridge Grouse Camp over by Reamer, which is near me. And we got to talking and pretty soon he was inviting me to go there and bring my dog. They could check out my dog and see if he was good. Um, bringing all my students there for this woodcock banding workshop. I mean, it, it was amazing. I, I put this up here um, so that those of you that might be interested you do not have to have a dog to attend this weekend. You do not even have to want to be a woodcock bander. You can attend this weekend, uh, May 13th, 14th, and 15th. You can attend it just to learn more and have some really amazing experiences with people and their dogs and adorable woodcock chicks. In order to become a bird bander, you need to be on a federal bird banning permit. And our, I, I'm on several of them, but one of them is the permit that Woodcock Minnesota has under Kyle Daly. He is our master bander. And I'm also on the University of Minnesota Duluth, the Natural Resources Research Institute permit. And both of them are for banding Woodcock. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Woodcock, Minnesota, and what is the purpose of having all of these people that have the ability to run dogs. They have really extremely well-trained dogs, and they know how to do all of this stuff. So having a whole bunch of people that know how to do this and have the ability to do this and are experienced is invaluable when you're trying to do Woodcock research. Now, if, if I were to go out and start doing, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe I'm going to start doing amphibian research. I can do a little reading and do a little learning and talk to some people and gain a little experience and, and I'll be ready, you know, within a matter of a couple of months. But in order to get out and to do woodcock research, you have to spend, you know, a couple of years training a bird dog and then that doesn't even, you know, address the whole bird banding part. So I'm bringing all this stuff to your attention because I want, I want everybody to realize that this is something that we take very seriously. So I want to introduce you to 
my pointing dogs, this is Riley. And this was taken about four years ago when we were banding or five years ago. Gosh, it's been a long time. Riley is a Gordon setter. And in this picture, he was four years old. He is, if there's a tortoise and a hare, he's the tortoise. He is slow, steady. He never gets phased. He knows exactly what his job is. Um, and I'm just really appreciative of this dog. When he points, he's not particularly stylish. He's not flashy. He doesn't have a lot of intensity. He pretty much stands there like that and points his nose to where he thinks the, the bird is. But, you know, I worked with Riley on a research project and I was having to run him sometimes for six hours a day. And it was not fair to him. I mean, he was young, he could handle it. And I gave him breaks. So I ended up getting another bird dog. This is Bogey. I got him in September of 2018. Getting a bird dog in at the beginning of bird hunting season is not ideal, but it gave me a lot of time to work with him. So by the following spring, um, his breeder slash trainer, um, Stephen Faust, he lives in North Carolina and he was up here and, and I gave him Bogey for a couple of weeks and he worked his magic and Bogey was steady to wing and shot, you know, within about a week, but he didn't have any experience at all. And you need to have experience um, with wild birds and to, to like get solid on wild birds before you're able to band. So I sent him the following hunting season. Um, Stephen worked with him, I worked with him, and then I sent him down to North Carolina to run on Woodcock in his guide string for the rest of the winter. When I got him back in February, he was absolutely ready to go. Here's Bogey on point. He has a lot of intensity and he has a lot of style. So I really like running this dog. He's also super fast, but when he stops, it's like he's hitting a brick wall and his legs will be in whatever position they were when he hit that scent. And sometimes that means that he can't maintain his stance and I'll come upon him in the woods and he will have fallen over but he still does not break point. Here he found a little convenient tree. You see a little sapling right there. He's leaning against that. He stops so fast that he falls over. So here's the tortoise and here's the hare. And these boys were actually pointing a brood in this picture. They both hit the scent at the same time. Now I'm harping on, you know, all of the dog work because bird safety is number one. Um, we are all about the birds. This is not about how many chicks have I banded versus somebody else. How many hens have I been able to catch? It's not about that stuff at all. So we go through a very extensive training program. The beginning of that is the weekend, but then you also go out and spend a lot of time with mentors until you are ready. These are some of the topics that we talk about, not just, you know, is your dog ready, but how do you, you know, how do you know when a, a bird is on a nest? Because you don't want to flush a hen off of a nest to find out if she's sitting on eggs or not. Um, you know, how do you handle chicks that are flighted already? Sometimes we find chicks that can fly a little bit. How do you handle birds? I'm actually going to talk to you about that a little bit. And then even how do you release the chicks? We want everybody to be safe. We want the hen to come back to her chicks. So we talk about a lot of different things. Here's a hen on a nest and they will sit incredibly tight. In fact, I have seen at least one video on YouTube of somebody, not a woodcock bander, petting a hen on a nest. I absolutely do not recommend that you do that. She will sit super tight. She's also not leaving a whole lot of scent there. So it gets really difficult for a dog to, you know, find her and, and point her. And I do have a video 
of bogey pointing a nest that I'm going to show you. The quality on this video isn't that great, but hopefully you'll be able to see. I'll stop it at the end so that you can see the hen on the nest. Whoa. And I tell him, whoa, just as a reminder, you know, this is early in the, in the breeding season. I, I'm just reminding him, don't move. So whoa is the command for that. And I'm going to stop it real quick here. I, I know this video is not very good, but you can see all of the brown in here. That is dirt. And if you know anything about earthworms, you know that they pull leaf, you know, vegetative matter into the soil. They mix it up. So when there's an area that has a lot of earthworms, oftentimes there will be no humus to the soil. It'll just be dirt with a scattering of leaves on top of it. But for us as woodcock banders and woodcock hunters, when you see an area like that, that's a clue that there might be birds in there because there's a lot of their food source. Oh, I guess we're starting over. Ooh. Now, I don't want to flush the hen off of the nest, so I'm very cautious. I spent a lot of time looking. And his body language is telling me with that head low and tail really high and just he's super intense. I know that there's a bird there somewhere. Now, oftentimes hens will nest near some sort of structure, whether it's a log or a base of a tree. They don't really nest out in, you know, a big open spot or even a little open spot. And I check back to see where is the dog pointing. And I know you can't hear that, but I said, oh, she's right there. So I, I don't do a very good job of getting her in the video, but I'll stop it as soon as you can see her. Okay. I don't know if you can see her, but I'm going to circle her. Here is her beak. Here's one eye. She's facing at the camera and here is her body. This is a log right here. And you can see that there's a tree right here. There's another, looks like a log or some branches that are down here. She's got a great little spot right there. When I do work for the university, we have field techs that go out every single day and they check the nests from, from afar. They're, they're not trying to dis disturb her um, because we have to know exactly when the nest or when the chicks hatch. Two days after they hatch, I go in and try and find the brood with my dog. And then I'm allowed, then I can, they're big enough for me to put radio transmitters on them. Um, I, I'm so, you know, I, I put all of this stuff on here because it's so difficult to locate the nest, even if you've seen it before and you know where it is. It's so difficult to, to relocate the nest, especially once vegetation starts to grow. So this is the this is a picture of what I would give to the field techs. You know, I would maybe flag about 10 meters away and give them a bearing and then give them a picture like this, probably several pictures. Once your dog finds a nest, you don't want to go all the way over there. And when you leave, you don't want to leave a dead end trail. So you would take the dog and you would heal the dog or have the dog by the collar and you will lead them past the nest, hopefully not too close, but past the nest because you don't wanna leave a dead end trail for a predator to follow and you know find that nest because they are ground nesters. A Little bit later on, you start to find broods and here's bogey on point again. At the time, I was not, I was not trying to capture hens. Um, so I was just trying to flush and then there goes the hen. 
And I'm actually going to stop this and go back a little bit. The quality is not that great. Here she is right here. She will, they do what's called a flutter flight if they're broody at all. So if they are on a nest or if they've got chicks, they will fly kind of in an upright posture and they will have their legs drop down a lot of times. It's not a strong flight. So that's why we call it a flutter flight. Usually they don't go very far. She actually flew pretty far, but I knew just based on, you know, the fact that she was doing a flutter flight and Bogey did move his head a little bit. So I was, I, he was very young at this point. I was really happy that he didn't move his feet. In order to find the chicks, they're incredibly well camouflaged. I slide my feet along. I'm very careful where I'm stepping. And then hopefully you can find a chick. Here's the beak. And they kind of hunker down a little bit. Here's the head. And look at the camouflage that they have. It is incredible. So there were four chicks in this brood. Once you uh, find them, this is a kind of all of our equipment. These are bird bags that we use and you can see that they're, they look like they're inside out. They're not actually inside out. Um, my mom sews these bags for me. She loves to sew. We don't want to have any strings on the inside of the bag. So that means, you know, we either turn them inside out or, or you finish the seams on the inside. You put all the chicks in one bag. They help to keep each other warm because at that point they cannot thermoregulate. This is what we use to measure the bill. So when chicks hatch, their, their bill is 14 millimeters long. And every day, every 24 hours, they add another two millimeters. So if you measure it and it's 18 millimeters, that means that chick is two days old. It hatched two days previous. So we are able to at least be somewhat accurate in our aging. It gets less accurate as they, as they get a little bit older. These are what the bands look like. You got something to write with. And these are the banding pliers. And you'll notice that first of all, there's a tip here. You insert that tip into the band and then open the pliers and it opens the band. And then you put the band inside this round hole and you're able to put the band um, without a possibility of, you know, flattening the band or anything like that on the bird's leg. This is a data sheet that we use for the Woodcock Minnesota banding program. So I told you that I would teach you, you know, how to handle chicks and this is the best way to handle them. Something about birds that's different from mammals like us, we have a diaphragm. And our diaphragm, when it contracts, it, it goes downward or toward our feet, and it creates a vacuum in our, our thorax, I guess, in our chest, and it allows air to come in. Well, birds don't have a diaphragm. So if I were to come up to you and give you a bear hug, and not let go, you would still be able to breathe because your diaphragm would still be able to, you know, create a vacuum in your chest. Birds do not have that ability. They don't have a diaphragm. So it's super important that you enable their keel. So their keel is their breastbone. That needs to be able to move in and out. That's how they breathe. If you hold birds around their body, you are running the risk of not allowing them to breathe. So what we do, and this is universal among banders, is you put the bird's neck between your pointer finger and your middle finger, and then you loosely just kind of have a cage around the rest of the body. Now this might look like I'm squeezing this bird's neck, but keep in mind they have twice as many cervical vertebrae as what we have. We have seven, they have 14. So their neck is super flexible. It's, it's fairly strong. 
And it's also very skinny, I guess is the right word. This bird has very fluffy feathers, but its neck is only about the size of a pencil. So I'm not hurting it at all. And I'm able to manipulate the bird. You can open it up. You can open up your hand and you can grip the legs so that you can put bands on them. Um, you know, it's a good way to hold them if you're trying to measure the bill because you've got a hold of the head. Um, and then I've done a whole bunch of other stuff with them, like for the university project. And I will tell you more about that in a little bit, I promise. We wanted to be able to individually identify each bird not in the hand. You know, of course, we put these, you know, the aluminum bands on them that have not a nine digit number on them. But you can't see those numbers if you're just looking at them with binoculars. We put these plastic bands on them. They're called color bands. And I use needle nose pliers and kind of curled each end around the pliers and then was able to put them on. And each one of the chicks got four, it, they got four bands, they got three color bands. And when I did this, because there's usually four chicks in a brood, I made sure that no other chick had yellow here, no other chick had blue here, um, because then when the field techs relocate them, and they relocated these chicks every single day to get their location, they would be able to say, ooh, this one has uh, yellow over aluminum, it's, it's this particular chick. They could individually identify them. We also put radio transmitters on them. And this is a, what we call a necklace attachment. This string right here is stretchy. So it's very easy to get it over the beak. This is an older chick, over the beak and then over the head. And it settles very nicely around the neck. Now you don't wanna have it be too loose because then it can spin and twist. And luckily we did not have if you do it correctly you don't have any issues we didn't have any issues with mortality because of our radio transmitters and we know that because we track them down every single day the number on here is 009 that is a unique identifier for that particular bird so when if you've ever used radio telemetry um, it will it'll flash that code up you know, when, when you locate that bird, it'll flash the code up on the screen so you know what it is that you're seeing. And then 5.1 just means that it sends out a radio signal. This is VHF, it sends out a radio signal every 5.1 seconds. So imagine these field techs. I had the fun job running dogs, picking up chicks, putting bands on them. These field techs worked every day starting at four o'clock in the morning and luckily there was a road through our study plot so they could go down the road but then they, they had to go into the woods with this you know receiver antenna and if you've ever been in early successional forests you know that it's it's thick and difficult to walk through in the first place okay so why are we studying woodcock because their populations have declined by over 30% in North America in the past 50 years. So there's something going on with them. And we're trying to figure out, um, because actually Minnesota does a really nice job with woodcock production. 10% of the global population breeds in Minnesota. This is a map that came from the Minnesota Breeding Bird Atlas. And you can see that pretty much where there's forest, there's going to be woodcock. And this, even up here in the Northwest, there are, there's uh, Aspen Parkland up there. So you can have woodcock up in that area. And down here, this is mostly ag. So the goals of this particular project, quantify the nesting habitat. When I said that they, they, they actually flagged every single location where the chicks were found, then they went back and not only did they did they look at vegetation and you know logs and other features that are on the ground but they also did invertebrate studies and they would they would gather invertebrates from that particular spot and then they would also go in a random direction and um, gather insects from 10 meters away so that they could they could you know compare the two of them 
Um, so we looked at nesting habitat, nest success, and then also juvenile survival. And I've got some data later on about that. Quantify their habitat use and post-fledge dispersal. So once they leave that nest, which is in within the first few hours after hatching, once they leave that nest, how far do they go? And what type of habitat are they using? And then the goal of this is to be able to say, ooh, this, this is a really great um, management plan for this particular forest if you want to have woodcock production. And I should mention that this project was not just about woodcock, but they were also studying other early successional species like golden wing warbler and also veery. So here's the study plot. This was um, kind of southeast of Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and north of Swan River. This was my main study area. It's not that big, though. I mean, I can, I can run that with dogs in a few hours. So this was my medium priority area. You can see the legend up here. And I also had these low priority areas. Like if I had time, I could go and run those areas. And I want to talk about this real quick. This is actually a square mile plot that we have been studying and doing breeding bird surveys for decades. And so we know what's there. This is all Blandon property, by the way, Blandon, the paper company. What they did in this square mile is they went in and they harvested it in a mosaic. So it's got, it's got areas where there's really young next to medium, next to a little bit older. There's some openings in there. There's, you know, you can see that there's logging roads. There are um, forested wetlands and open wetlands in there. And I did several years of bird surveys in this area. We mapped out every single observed bird within that square mile. I have never recorded so many ruffed grouse and woodcock in a square mile plot. I started doing breeding bird surveys in 1997. So this area right here was incredible. I located myself just walking through the forest, three woodcock broods. I've never found them anywhere else in all of my years of doing point counts for the university. Incredible. So they knew that, of course, because the data's there. That's why they picked this area. Something was going right. We had to at least know where the dogs were running. Um, I wasn't allowed to use a beeper collar or bells because they're studying other species in that area and they don't wanna affect the research. So I ran my dogs silently with GPS collars on and I have a unit that shows all of their tracks on it and where they are and it tells me when they go on point. These are all of my dog's tracks, probably just from a couple of days. I want to point out this right here and that right there. All of these symbols were where I found broods. Right here, here, and here. Now the interesting part, I'm going to go back a screen. This area is right here. And there is a power line right of way that goes right through there. So I found it to be very interesting that I had nests. These pins are nests that I found in that area. Sometimes they were, you know, 40 meters apart, these nests. It was incredible. And then here's where all the broods were found. So there was some sort of concentration in that one area and not a whole lot of birds in the other parts. Here's a flagging that I found. This is one of the flaggings that shows that, you know, the field techs marked this spot and they're going to come back and they're going to do vegetation and invertebrate work. Some of the things that they found, or one of the really interesting things that they found, um, you know, later on in the season, there's a lot of vegetation on the ground and the chicks don't have any problem. <laughs> in fact, you know, trying to find them on the ground when you find a brood and it's just a carpet of green is super difficult. So here's a chick that was hiding and I managed to find it. But early in the season, when the majority of the woodcock chicks are on the ground, it looks like this. 
there isn't a whole lot of cover for them. So one of the things that the researchers discovered is that they, they most of the time found broods within a short distance from cover, like a log or down big down branches or something like that. I don't know if you can see the chick in here. Maybe you've got a good search image for woodcock chicks. There it is right there. And I didn't move that chick. That's where I found that chick. So it just kind of goes to show you that, yeah, they do. They, they run and they'll hide if they have enough time. We did study survival rate. So over here, we've got survival rate. And here we have their age. This is hatching. This red line is where they can fly. They can't fly great distances, but they can fly a little bit. And then this is when they start to become pretty independent. Their survival rate increases quite a bit as they age. And then of course, levels off when they can fly. And I believe the next slide is about how far do they move from the nest. Here again is hatching, 10 days, about 15, 16 days is when they can do some short flights. And then this is this, this is the deviation from that. But you can see that the older they get, the further they end up going from the nest. And they don't, they don't come back to the nest area. So this is meters. 750 meters is approximately a half a mile. So I'm going to go back a second. We only had these radio transmitters collecting data or sending out, you know, signals for about 42 days, but they're not done. You know, it's, it's, it's June and they still have a lot of growing and a lot of maturing to do. And so we decided that we need to get more data and because the radio transmitters would only go for 42 days. And frankly, once they get to this point right here, you can't catch them anymore. It's very difficult to catch them because they just fly away. So we decided to put satellite transmitters on not the chicks because they're still growing, but we were putting satellite transmitters on the adults. And of course, we can capture hens. It's not super easy. My learning curve was really steep. This is tubing and it's stretchy string. It's medical tubing. And this forms a harness. It's called a leg loop harness. And it's very similar to a climbing harness for a human. It's got, well, these little loops right there, you can connect it to a computer to recharge it and, you know, update the satellite information. And then this is the antenna. But of course, how do you catch a woodcock hen? You cannot catch her. Well, you can catch her but you must not catch her when she is on the nest. There is, because there's been research done about this, there is a 100% abandonment rate with a hen if you capture her on the nest. She will 100% abandon. And not only that, because they put transmitters on her, they were able to, to find out where she went. She would oftentimes go seven or more kilometers away. So it was not a good thing. This was not going to be an option for me. But they hold really tightly when they have chicks on the ground also. I found this picture on the internet. Earl Johnson it was a biologist. He's retired. And he, as well as a number of people that are watching this presentation, have been banding woodcock since the 90s. And this is the net that he uses. And you just slowly and carefully get up there and you can lay the net right over the hen and catch her. I missed quite a few because my net didn't look like that. I had a kind of like trout netting. It was black and it was really, you couldn't see through it very well. And I suspect that the hens probably thought it was some sort of black cloud that was coming over them. It was really difficult to catch them. Then I changed the netting on my net and I was having some success. And there's Katie. Katie was out with me when I caught my very first hen. And I was super happy, A, because I finally caught one. And B, because Katie was there and she's got 
very amazing bird handling abilities. So you can see that she has the bird in her hands right here. She was actively monitoring whether the bird was, you know, moving its keel in and out. We laid one of my bird bags over the bird's head to minimize disruption, disturbance to the bird, minimize kind of that input that might make them more stressed. And then the bird's legs are hanging down right here. So I was able to put that leg loop harness on the bird. Here's what it looks like on the bird. We don't use solar because you they get covered with feathers. You can't even see it on this bird right here but you can see the antenna that's coming out. I managed to put three before I wasn't able to, you know, find any more young broods anymore. So then I had to wait until late summer and early September. So birds do, or woodcock, I should say, do a crepuscular flight, which means they fly around in the morning, they fly around right at dusk, so I started to set up mist nets because I still had radio transmitters to put on. I was trying to catch birds. So I went out into a field and you can see that bird that just flew. And then there's another bird that flew over my head. And I thought, ooh, I bet I caught some in my mist net. But yeah, I did not. I saw 14 birds fly around me and I didn't catch a single one in my net. So I knew that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to try harder. When I guide at Pine Ridge, I'm there in the evening for dinner. And it was great because I had people like uh, Bailey Peterson and Stephen Faust and people that were willing to come out there and help me set up these mist nets. These are stacked mist nets. So it's one mist net and then another one stacked on top of it because they fly pretty high. I set up this net the first time and I got lucky. I went down there, it's dark out, and I had three birds in my net. I was super thrilled, and a whole bunch of people were able to watch. Um, Stephen held the bird for me, and Bailey was taking pictures, and I was able to put two radio transmitters on the birds. The third one was too small, didn't have enough mass to carry a radio transmitter. And again, here's what they look like. So what this is enabling us to do is to not only know where they go for the rest of the summer, like those, the three hens that we put radio transmitters on in May, we were able to see what did they do in June, July, August, September, and all the way into January, they're down here. So I've got one here, I have one here, I have one here, and one here. I have a total of five transmitters out, but one of them we're not receiving signals from anymore. We don't know if it failed, if it fell off, or if the bird died. So we, we won't really know, but I do have four. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. The first one was banded about right here. And then we started to receive signals and she had a brood and she spent all summer in this one area. And you can see this is really young Aspen right in here. So she spent some time there. This is all, oh, there's Alder in here. But she also spent some time in some, in some older stuff. Then she flew 20 miles south in the fall and, and hung out down here. So what we'll be able to do is you can do remote sensing so you can look at the aerial photos of where they are and look at the type of habitat they're using and when. Right now, this adult hen is down in Louisiana and this is all pine plantation. We finally figured out what this habitat type is. This is a cut and that's the last data point that I have from her. The second one, she was banded right around in here and then I got a few data points. This was every three days. And then she took off and she went up by Thief Lake. So she was northeast of Thief Lake. And she hung out there the rest of June, July, August, September, and then finally left in October. So we don't, we're not really sure why she moved up there. Um, 
we don't think that she would leave her brood. You know, the, the brood would not be capable of sustained flight of 175 miles. So we're suspecting that she lost her brood and then she left and flew north. Right now, she is right on the Texas line. So she's just west of Texarkana. And she is hanging out. I think this is probably a hay field right here. And this is a power line right there. Sassy is an immature male. And we banded him over by Reamer in one of those mist nets. And then he took off and went north. This is Red Lake right here. So south of Baudette. And hung around up there for a little while. And then flew south. Couldn't really make up his mind where he wanted to be. So he flew here, then he flew up here, here, here. And keep in mind these data points now after the middle of July, they're five days apart. So I've got all these data points and right now he's down here. Gandhi was an immature male and he was pretty interesting. We banded him over here. This is Reamer and here's where Pine Ridge Grouse Camp is. He flew southwest a little bit and then flew up here. And you can see there's many data points up here spent, you know, the last week of September and early October up here. And then he flew and he flew southeast and rounded the tip of Lake Michigan and flew over by Columbus, Ohio, then flew south. And right now he is right at the, let's see, the Georgia, Alabama line. And he's just hanging out down there. All this is pine plantation also. So a few weeks ago, this was in the Duluth News Tribune. And I really like this graphic that they made. So you can see where the birds went. Here's where Gandhi went. All the way here and then down in here. The rest of them are here, 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 and then one there. Debbie, I think we have a question from an audience member and you did give me oh, okay to stop you. So um, Tom Peterson, if you would like to drop your question into the chat, the, or excuse me, the Q&A function, please go ahead and do that. Um, I'll lower the hand. If you'd like to have me unmute you and um, you want to use the audio function, please let me know um by just raising your hand again otherwise just drop that question into the q a function and uh we'll give debbie a chance to respond to it okay while he's doing that i will i'm going to continue so you can look at a forest like this and and remember that we're looking at productivity when i walk into a forest like this after 20 some years of doing point counts every summer i walk into this forest and i think two things First of all, I think, yay, it's going to be really easy walking. And B, I think this is going to be really boring. Because forests like this, while they are important, they don't really have the same degree of productivity that, you know, an early or even mid-successional forest has. When I walk in here, I will hear oven birds and red-eyed vireos. I might hear an American red start or two, um, but really it's going to be pretty quiet. So I'm going to show you because I love sharing, you know, this stuff. I bring people out with me all the time. Here are some former students of mine that couldn't go out in 2020 because of COVID. I brought them out with me last year, but look at this forest, this young aspen forest. I will show you a video at one point and you're going to hear a whole bunch of different birds in this forest, very different from you know, that, that open oak forest. Another student of mine, actually, she's a senior right now. I, I took my ornithology class out there. I teach all my ornithology students how to band birds. They go through a very strict training protocol. And I even bring adults out. This was guy from the Yukonuba film crew. They were out shooting some advertising footage, but look at that. Super cute. Check out a PhD student. She's actually going to be studying the flight dynamics of the sky dance. So she's going to be putting satellite transmitters on birds and then getting 
information while they're doing the sky dance. Sometimes I take out colleagues. Ben teaches English at my high school and I, I can't put satellite transmitters on by myself. So I was begging people to come out with me and he was pretty happy because we found a brood and put a transmitter on a hen. Another former student of mine, he's going into fisheries biology. I did tell him that he was allowed to come out with me anyway. Okay, this is Connor and he is a former student of mine and he actually is going into wildlife biology as well as his girlfriend. They both go to school in Ely. I think that his reaction to these chicks is, <laughs> yeah, just watch. <laughs> that one's still got like stuff on his beak. That's the egg tooth. Oh my lord. Oh my lord. They are adorable. So I would love to open it up to questions. I want to thank these people for letting me use their photos and, and just a little plug for LCCMR, which was our funding source for this project. So I don't know, Katie, do you want people to unmute? Can you unmute people if they raise their hand? It's probably sure. easier than having them type questions. Thank you. Yes, I think um, if we have questions, yes, please drop them into the Q&A function not in the chat, that way we can keep all the questions organized in one area. Um, if you would prefer not to type or you're doing this from your cell phone and it's a little bit harder, um, please raise your hand and then I can unmute you um, to do that would, as well. Would you unmute Jackie Fallon? Because she typed in a question, but I'm not sure if she's asking about the satellite transmitters or the radio transmitters. Ah, sure, one moment. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you, Jackie. <laughs> Great job, Debbie. I was very excited to um, see this presentation. Yeah, I'm really interested in your satellite transmitter um, longevity um, that you're putting on these hens. It does. It matters what your schedule is. So we did a schedule that would would some it would send a signal every three days until I think it was July 15th. And then after that, we switched it to every five days. Um, we use the low tech um, pinpoint re or satellite transmitters. Um, and they have a really cool function where you can go in and you can set a schedule and then it will tell you how long that transmitter battery should last. So then you can, you can kind of mess with your schedule a little bit and then and so that you have the longevity that you need. Uh, what is your goal with with these? Do you hope to get a year? Could you potentially get a two year time period off of some of these birds, depending no, on? No, I I I would I would be surprised if I got data from the hens through even the migration. But because we put those on in May of last year, and I don't think that the battery life is going to last that long. But the males, the two immature males, those were put on at the end of September. So I'm really hopeful that we will not only get the spring migration, but then we'll also be able to see what are males doing during the breeding season? You know, how much time do they spend on their singing grounds and where do they spend the, you know, all of that information. Very exciting. Very exciting. I'm waiting for my first doodle to arrive in Minneapolis on territory. Um, yep, we got to get you hopefully alive and not, <laughs> um, uh, a meal, but I'll be in touch as always. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Looks like there's some stuff in the chat. Oh, thanks. It was fun to see those little cuties. They are so adorable. <laughs> okay. Um, Abraham said, if we would like to read this research, can we find it somewhere? Probably the best thing to do right now is to follow me on Facebook or Instagram because I 
post the maps um, as they're, you know, as I'm seeing them. And then I also post a lot of stuff about the research in the spring. There isn't anything that has been published as of yet, but when it is, I will post that on Facebook and Instagram. And Debbie, is that your, if, if somebody wants to follow on Facebook, is it your personal account or is it under a project? It would be my personal account. Yep. So just look for Debbie Peterson and it's, it's got that same, well, I guess I don't know which picture I have up there right now, um, but you'll, you'll find me on there. Or if you know Katie, we're, we're friends on there. So if you can, if you can find Katie, you can find me. Um, Chris asks, what does the certification process for pointing dogs involved? Are there established standards? Yep, one can use to prepare their dog. And if yes, where can these standards be found? That is a great bunch of questions. So we do have kind of a certification booklet that we're putting together. And we do, it's kind of a checklist. So we do have things that are put together. If you are interested, <clears throat> excuse me, in getting that information, you should contact me or one of the other people in Woodcock, Minnesota. Um, Anna says, fascinating, love this. Does the transmitter ultimately fall off or is this on the bird permanently? It is the radio transmitters, eventually those would just fall off because we use super glue and and that string would you know it would fail eventually um the satellite transmitters those are on there permanently there there really isn't any way for the bird to get those off um oh and do you hunt these birds too yes i do i know for a lot of people there's a dichotomy between you love these birds and you 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 know love to do research on them but I also love to hunt them. Um, hunting is different than shooting and I'm not the world's greatest shot and you know, they're hard to hunt, but they're really fun. Yeah. Uh, Debbie, I have a question. So yeah. as you were, as you were presenting and talking about the movements of these birds and um, you know, kind of what you're getting as far as that bigger picture goes with those transmitters, um, I started thinking about you know, the areas that they're traveling to and looking at what that annual cycle looks like in terms of movements. And what would you say are some of the, the greatest threats to these birds, recognizing that they are migratory. So that period of movement, like those threats can be different than they were at the beginning of a chick's lifestyle or um, life cycle to, you know, as the bird gets a little bit older, but what does, what does that look like in terms of like the top, you know, kind of threats? For these well, birds. when they're an adult, that's going to be totally different than when they're, you know, a young chick. Birds basically have about an 80% mortality rate within their first year. After that, their mortality rate drops quite a bit. Um, and that's true for every kind of bird. Um, it's really hard to tell, you know, what's, what is affecting their populations. And that's part of what this research is about is, is saying, okay, here's where they're really productive. And these are the things that they need in order to be really productive. Um, you know, as far as migration dangers, it could be anything from, you know, raptors. It could be getting hit by a car. It could be, you know, hitting a window. It could be, you know, feral cats or, or outdoor cats. Um, but I also think that it's super important to have the right habitat for them. You know, a, a lot of times we, we look at what's happening with birds and it all comes down to, hey, they can do really well if they have the right habitat. Great, thank you. And I think that kind of leads into the last question that we have in the Q&A box here. Uh, what can we all do to help woodcocks? What does that look would, like depending on where people yeah, are? Yeah, you know, individual people, what you can do is you, you can support um, organizations like you know, Woodcock, Minnesota, or Rough Grouse Society, which is kind of a sister to the American Woodcock Society. There's lots of habitat projects that happen within organizations. So that is something that people can do is to support that. Um, if you've got, you know, I live, I live in the Chippewa National Forest, and they don't really do a ton of, of, um, it's the word I'm thinking of logging. They don't really do a whole lot of harvesting. 
And so when I go hunting and I'm looking for early successional forest to hunt in, I oftentimes am going to county land, some state land, but the majority of the national forest is big trees. And so it, it, supporting logging and harvesting activities is something that we can all we can all do. You know, not all of us have land that we can, you know, have a plan and, and do our own logging, but just saying, yeah, logging is important and we need to have early successional forests. So that's something that we can all do is to support that. That's great. And we didn't even plan this. You didn't, I didn't plan this uh, in our, our pre-program conversation, but uh, the next, next month Audubon chapter of Minneapolis program is exactly about that, is about, you know, what, um, what it takes to provide the right kind of habitat, what forestry looks like, um, lots and lots of really cool stuff to discuss around that. And I think, it, you know, um, I'm excited about that and thinking that there will be a lot of light bulbs going on as people are learning about how much uh, things have changed and how um, harvesting plays a really important role in helping to manage forests when we've eliminated so much of those disturbances that um, used to occur very naturally. So great example. Thank you. Perfect. We didn't even, we didn't even plan that. We didn't plan that. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. If there are any final questions, please drop them into the question and answer function or raise your hand and I'll go ahead and unmute you. I do want to thank Debbie Peterson again for such a fantastic program that was really interesting. Um, your passion for these birds and for the places that they rely on really comes through. Um, and I hope that it inspires some people to check out that Woodcock Banding uh, workshop and to learn a little bit more and, and have an opportunity to get out there and see um, the kinds of habitat that these birds really rely on in order to, to survive and to thrive. Very good. Thank you very much for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Great. So for everyone still hanging on, uh, this is a recorded program. We will upload this to our Audubon chapter of Minneapolis YouTube uh, account, and then we'll go ahead and share that through social media. And then once we post that to our Facebook page, I'll make sure to uh, Debbie drop your contact um, through Facebook in that yes. post, so it will be a nice direct line for people that want to follow what's happening with this project and what's happening with the birds. All right, Sounds thank great. you everyone. Have a great evening and hopefully we'll see you next month. Great, thank you everybody.